Good morning. Uh, this is Pam Ferris. And Pam, um, it's a delight and pleasure to talk to you. Um, I, I have to be honest, I mean, I, I, I need to tell you that I saw you in the 70s um, at the ICA. Way back then, way, way back. back. Then. You were doing a show called Sh Science Fictions. Yes. And um, as I've said in one of the talks that, that Mike and I have been um, having, uh, it was the funniest piece of theatre I'd oh. ever, ever, ever seen. I, I, I'm very, very flattered and thrilled that you loved it. Thank you. Um, and I know that we're gonna, we've got other stuff to say about that, but uh, your character just, you know, shines still after 40,000 years. Um, <laughs> now, so what we're really here to talk about is, is your relationship with Mike. Mm -hmm. And, and um, that, well, let's start at the beginning. How on earth did you ever come across him? What happened? How did you get to start to work with him? It was in Sheffield. Um, I was working there. I was a jobbing actress and, and getting scraps of choreography work from my friend Sue Lefton. I had just choreographed Joseph and the Technicolor, an amazing Technicolor dream coat there. And I had been kept on to do some shows around the, the, the theatre and in the studio. And a touring group called Shared Experience arrived to play in the studio. And on my night off, from work, I went to see them and it blew my mind. They, for a start, the studio was completely empty. There was no, none of the seating was there and you were handed a cushion as you came in and you could sit where you liked. <laughs> Nobody was directing you and the actors were already there welcoming you in and chatting. And slowly a shape formed whereby there was a performance area and a seating area and it was interesting how people shuffled around their bums on the floor to kind of get together and left part of it open for us, which was sort of instinctive. Not for us, I wasn't part of the company then, for them. And they did the prototype performance of the Arabian Nights. Now that grew massively over time, but it was, I was watching a company, I believe of six then, and I just started talking to Mike in the green room and going, my goodness, how did that happen? How did that happen? And uh, uh, very soon I started um, saying I wanted to, to work with him and we got together, we made another company with the help of the Arts Council. The money ran out very quickly. We rehearsed on the dole. But I'm going to stop you for a second. Yes. It makes it sound so simple that suddenly you're working with Mike. I mean, yes, did you it not was. have an audition or? No, I don't think I did. Wow. I don't think I did. I spoke to him about the work pretty extensively. And then I got a phone call and maybe I went to a workshop there. They were probably doing workshops in the daytime with actors around the crucible, but I didn't officially audition, if I remember rightly. I just said, yes, please, please, I want to be part of it. Okay, okay. So so when you say um, you started working with him, was that up in Sheffield or was that back down in London? No, th yes, there was a, a remounting of the company. There was, that was a short tour, which was financed, I believe. Um, um, six or eight weeks something like that and then the company was reformed uh, and we put together an Arabian Nights show and took it up to um, Edinburgh for the festival and won a, f a fringe first ah okay yeah and then we just felt that well I don't know if it was we ever or if just simply Mike was leading I don't the memory is of being so absorbed by it and just wanting it to get better and better and better mm. and making more shows from this original concept, get finding finance wherever we could, Newham financed us to go around the schools. And we did Little Children, which was very touching and exciting. We put together a show in a week for the children My because we were so integrated as a group by then, we could, we could throw things up very quickly. Mike, um, Mike talks about the experience of playing in schools and how yes. you play for the older kids and the younger kids. And 
well, we're going to come on to your hair at some point. Yes. <laughs> but but um, the, he said that, that, that you would get these letters from the school kids saying, and there were these castles and there were these dragons. They would draw them. They would draw them, draw what they saw. And, and to, for those who are not initiated to shared experience, there was nothing. We just worked in a space. We didn't have costumes as such, but we wore clothes that were firstly loose fitting and easy to move it because that was vital, but also had a hint of a slightly hippie vision of the Middle East, I guess, if we were doing um, the Arabian Nights. You know, they were easy to find those shirts with the embroidery around the neck. They were very simple, very plain, uh, plain colors, but we'd never changed our costumes and everybody wore a similar outfit. So anything in the way of visual impression was gained through the children's and the audience's imagination only. Yeah. No backdrop, just yeah. the space. Poor uh, theatre at its best, I think. Tell, tell me, um, were you instrumental in, um, because at one point Mike talks about you all sort of discussing what you were going to call this company. Oh, before my time, I was lumbered. Oh, you were lumbered with shared experience. Yes, I was lumbered. And then it happened in that first six weeks. I don't know how it happened, but at the time it was deeply embarrassing to me that I would say, people would ask me where I was working. I'd say, I was in a shared, uh, shared experience. I go, because it just was such a hippie name and I was so embarrassed by it. Of course, it's an honest name. It's what it was. It was a shared experience. And I wouldn't apologize for it now, but at the time I did. Yes, that's so interesting. And of course, Mike is so not a hippie. No, <laughs> no. Um, so the, the clothing you're talking about and the idea of the of yes. company called Shared Experience might give you the impression that somehow this was, um, this was all you just indulging yourself. Or oh, a dope smoking guru kind of a thing. No, 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 nothing like that. It was incredibly disciplined. There was one day when we were working, I think it might have been another show, but it, it shows you what happened. We would come into the rehearsal room and head pretty much straight into our warm up at, on the time of starting um, rehearsals. And we would all do our individual warm ups to get our bodies working. And then we would probably do a collective warm up to get ready for the day. There was a time when Mike was sitting watching us come in and he said, I don't want you to talk about the journey or say good morning or any of those things anymore. I want you to come in and quietly put your things away and start your warm up without speaking. And there was some serious eye rolling at that point between a few of us going, what are we in here? Mm -hmm. This is getting a bit too disciplined for my liking. Mm -hmm. So I think we fought back on that one. Okay and refused to be silenced. But the concept of treating the day with great respect mm. and treating each other, not being late, treating each other with great respect mm. uh, was always there. Was, was, was it something, Pam, that you had in you already or, or were, you, were you learning a whole load of new ways of working? I think I was always a fairly physical actor. I used to be an actress, by the way. Apparently, I'm an actor now. Anyway, um, I I always used to be fairly physical, and I did a lot of dance work and musicals, and I was very aware that you used everything that you had. But Mike took that to another level and demanding more of us physically than I even knew I could give. Mm. And vocally. I mean, extraordinary stuff we achieved. And thereby opened us up to possibilities, our own possibilities, which has for me ended up with a very strong philosophy about what it is to be a human being. Because I've experienced some amazing things on stage that I didn't know I was capable of. Mm. Gosh, okay. Do you want to expand? Not, on that? not trivial, this stuff. It's pretty, no, no. pretty serious stuff. I mean, you know, you, the, the amount of work that was involved in those early days, the amount of energy that, number one, I experienced when I watched you. Right. Uh, you know, I saw you in, in first in science fiction, and so I saw you in Cymbeline afterwards. Right. Uh, the amount of energy that exuded off the stage, and now what I know, having assisted Mike and having talked to him all, over all these years, the amount of energy that was required of you in rehearsal. Mm -hmm. 
mm. the amount of commitment and time. I mean, did you always have this sort of endless resource of energy as you came into rehearsals? I think so, yes. I think I was blessed with high energy from early. And also, um, uh, I, I think we, we talked, Mike and I talked about um, confidence. And he said he likes people who have confidence. And I, without thinking, again, this is something that has happened through is trusting your own internal process. I said, it's not confidence. I said, the only time I've ever noticed confidence in actors is when they're overconfident. Mm -hmm. Confidence seems to me to be someone who knows they can do it. What you need is the courage to try. Mm -hmm. And courage and confidence are quite different if you think about it but you don't head into something knowing what it's going to be like or knowing you can do it, but you explore, mm. you open yourself to it. Mm. And that I think needs a courage and a lack of self-protection. But where did that come from? Because, you know, it is so exposing in some ways, presumably what you were doing. And what, you is, know... what is there to be frightened of? What, what everybody in the audience is exactly as complicated and as as big and vast internally as I am. And that's not an ego talking, that's just a, a confident, no, confident, just a knowledge that mm. that is true. Mm. Um. In terms of chronology, after after um, Arabian Nights, you then went into, and you know, it, I mean, you went into Bleak House, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was fun. We we actually loved it. We lost people along the way who couldn't hack it. No names, no pack drill. So the company reduced from its original number. So we were playing. I mean tens almost hundreds of characters between just a very few actors and again no props a suitable single costume that that did the job but we allowed ourselves the luxury of five chairs that was pretty impressive touring and uh and we used dickens narration and um and so virtually what you had was the book, which was edited, edited, edited down. And if you could act it, you didn't say it. If you couldn't act it, you used Dickens words. And there's a lot of dialogue there as well. So we used the narration about ourselves, the narration about the situation, and then us, just us doing it. Uh, the, <laughs> we started off with about half the book, as one evening, promising to come back for more. We then, over a period of touring, condensed that down to about a third of the book and put in another two evenings, but we still hadn't really got the grip of it. So we kept condensing down the evenings, which meant we went on with bits of paper. And we'd go, no, that scene's cut. <laughs> Stop, that scene's cut. I'm so sorry, that's the phone. Do you want to edit that out? Yeah, it doesn't matter. I mean, oh, these, there you go. Yeah. My husband's picked it up. Um, so we, for months, we went on stage not knowing what we were doing, and we had slowly, organically, out of this, four complete shows developed. And I think one of my most extraordinary experiences in the theatre was in the theatre upstairs at the Royal Court. Towards the end, when we were on top of it and doing well, and we did part one and part two on Saturday matinee evening and part three and part four on the Sunday matinee and evening to the same audience. Oh. And it was mind blowing. It was mind blowing. It was as if we were all involved in something that was so much greater than the sum of its parts. Mm. Um, I, I'm, I'm getting a bit tearful here because it was fantastic. Those people who have the stamina to sit through that achieved so much as an audience, and, and we did as actors. It was wonderful. Mm. Mm. And all those new things that you must have been learning, because how, oh, many, yeah. how many shows you'd have done where you were playing, you know, where the storytelling was happening and you were you're moving between, as you said, probably 30, 40, 50 characters. Yeah. 
I mean, absolutely stunning. Well, it tells you something about what character is, and the character is not something set. I think that I have had some really unpleasant experiences with um, writers and directors misunderstanding the concept of character over the last few years. And that um, I have tried to fight back on that, but I think I've lost the battle, really. I think I've lost the battle. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a quick example. I, there was a character I played on television that I was very, very fond of, and she came from a truthful book, a, a, a book of what actually happened, and I loved this character so much. And I worked on, on it a lot, and, uh, and then the writer started to pick up on what I was doing. It was an ongoing series, and the writers picked up on what I was doing. And the stage directions became very pantomimic in the sense that they would say, so-and-so, my character, stomps into the room. Mm -hmm. And I thought, this is my creation. Maybe I'd be allowed to decide how I walk into a room. But they had this concept of her, which was cheap, and it hurt. And I had to fight back on that. I don't know if any of that makes any sense to anyone who isn't an actor, but yeah. Yeah, it, yeah. it's the kind of thing that you s struggle with in modern television. There is pantomimic. So, so, so it's about um, it, it's what you're saying is that the danger is nailing down the kind of yeah obvious signposts for who a character yes, is. Yes, stretching it out between, you know, join the dots kind of character. We're all far more complicated than that. We're all far more. We have parts of ourselves that we don't understand. And that character on screen had parts of herself that she didn't understand. I have to allow for that if I want to give her 360 degree portrait of someone and so when you're told to stomp mm. it, it does it sort of because because you go well well how does one stomp you know i mean yeah what you do is you come go from subjective to objective and it can be very damaging that can be very damaging i'm not talking about method acting in the oh don't talk about my character what i mean is oh you call that a stomp for me that was tiredness and aching feet And let me find that. And I should be able to find that anyway, because yes. of the context in which this event is happening. Yes, if, yes, you know, exactly. Do I, do and I it might be that she doesn't, that she is so tired that day that she can't stomp. But no, it became stomped. Almost every entrance was stomps in. And contrast that then with what you what you're experiencing, let's say, with the Dickens or right. You know, what what is. What is going on with the process that you had then Oof. which you felt was valuable? Well, right. they are but worlds in terms of character, Just in terms of character. Just in terms of character. Well, in terms of, of the, the Dickens, Dickens feeds you. So you have a, a wonderful descriptions which you can embody. And then you don't need those words anymore because you've embodied them. Yeah. And you... Uh, I, there are, it's, we're talking about something which is very hard to find words for, but a, a, a character is a vehicle. It is not a static sculpture. It's a vehicle that you drive and you drive it in ways that, that are hopefully um, fresh every time you experience them. If you're going to do the same every night, stick it on film. Don't expect me to turn up and see a rehash of the previous night because it's not alive, it's not fresh. Mm. It's not really happening now. Mm. And for it to really happen now, you have to open yourself up. And I'm sure I've worked with people who think, why can't she do it the same every night, for goodness sake? And on, on screen, I have tried to keep it fresh, but then you're, you're dealing with minuscule little changes, like you're keeping it fresh by not doing the same tiny move every time you're doing a subtly different tiny move every time i'm just to mm. keep it alive mm. and pam um as an actor you, you you're do, you're in the middle of doing um uh the dickens and you haven't you're not fully on top of it yet okay no 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 right are no. you seeing are you seeing 
the other actors or are you still in your in your head in those early days when you're starting to perform it or have you got to a stage i asked this as, a, as an actor when i was a young man sometimes yeah. you didn't you kind of couldn't see the other person you weren't available for the other person because you were so worried about what you were doing and oh know, yeah oh mind. i see what you mean you mean properly as mike describes it talking to each other yeah yeah it's so simple and it's so hard to do just talk to each other he and i had a, a conversation recently and i'm thanking you very much for letting us get back together and encouraging that because it's been bliss um about a lovely french television series called engrenage um, the spiral and there they talk to each other they inhabit their characters and they really talk to each other it's not overwritten like a lot of English uh, and British television is. It's not wordy, but it's so real, so deep. And they, they connect. And therefore, we connect with them. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, did I not see the other actors? I think there was a camaraderie about us um, at that point in, in shared experience where you'd see that someone had a handle on something and you would internally cheer. Oh, yes, you're getting it, you know, so you would love that. Mm -hmm. And also we would offer each other our variety and freshness and it became like a football match. It was as unexpected and fresh as that when it worked. Right, right. And so the the pressure to get it right in inverted commas. Yes. Did you feel that during the course of your time or? Certainly when I started, when I started working with Mike, I felt utterly abandoned on our first night. I thought I have no idea what's gonna happen. And I don't even know where I'm gonna stand. Um, on the other hand, I was absolutely full of information about the world, the character, what they wanted, most importantly, and you just go out and do it somehow. And the, the sheer repetition, repetition of that experience of being terrified and, and unsure just slowly becomes normal. And this is what I mean about the bigger philosophy, because we, we as human beings, really long for that secure knowledge thing, and it, it's a it's a fallacy actually. Mm -hmm. There isn't in life any such thing as stability and security. We we know that intellectually, but to live it openly is um, is mm -hmm. something else. Mm -hmm. And to be present, therefore, with yes. with the moment that you're engaged in. Yes. Yes. Rather than going, oh my goodness, this isn't what it should be. Or... No, and and uh, it dangerously sounds like therapy or um, a lack of um, artistic uh, taste, because all those things, the taste is very important and the focus is very important. So although you're open, you're balancing. Oh, can I just talk about the process of learning how to become an actor? Because it's a nightmare. There's a, a thing I, I was talking to Mike about that they say a painter, every brush stroke is correcting the mistake of the previous one. And that's a bit like acting in that you learn something and you, you see the top of the mountain, you get up there, you kind of inhabit that new knowledge and then you see another mountain. Mm -hmm. And when you're climbing that mountain, you forget about that lesson behind you. So you have to kind of drag that lesson up and slowly all these multiple things. I remember even before I met Mike, you'd, I'd learnt certain technical abilities and I was putting them into practice and someone at the back said, I can't hear you. And you go, no, you can't hear me. So you, you've got to keep everything going. It's very, very demanding, but that's what I love. Mm. 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 Okay. Okay. Um, um, I'm going to, I'm going to go back to chronology. Uh, yeah. You are still working despite the fact that you've spent a whole year working on one mammoth novel. 
Right. I mean, you know, I, I, I just don't, I, I really don't get it because it's, it's sort of, having said that, you know, you, you are doing something that you love and one shouldn't be too kind of indulgent to actors in the sense that, you know, Mike made actors work hard. He makes Ooh. it work hard. But, you know, there are plenty of people who have to work hard in their lives. Right. And very few of them actually work hard in stuff that they absolutely adore doing. I appreciate that tremendously. Don't forget, we were on something like 23 quid a week. Yeah. And we were touring five nights a week. So you really had to commit to that. So yes, the, the joy of doing what you want is great, but the rewards were pretty minimal. And it, uh, you know, so it was not indulgent in that sense. It was hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Also, when we had done a week away and in our minibus, because we didn't have any uh, furniture much to, to transport, so we would just all get in the minibus. And on Saturday night, Mike would drive us back. Now, Mike would be so enthused about giving notes on that performance that he had just watched that sometimes on the motorway, he would go right down to 20 miles an hour. And we behind the... Oh, I'll never get home. Please, Mike, can you go at least up to 60? And <laughs> so, yeah. That is so that was our kind of life, that our, our journey home was also work. Yes, and I mean, this is something that you and I have talked about. And of course, Mike acknowledges mm. that, um, you know, it's sometimes coming into the dressing room after a performance wasn't always the most clever thing to do. I don't know. How would you put it? I, I think some people found it harder than others. I, uh, I saw a couple of people really struggling with it. And I, I think I said something to Mike about, look, can we just get to the bar and have a drink before you start, Mike? Can we just take a deep breath after the performance, let the adrenaline drop a bit, and then let's, we can talk about it then. Because uh, it's hard. It's very hard to take, to engage in a conversation with someone about what you've just done when you are tired and adrenalized. Yeah, yeah. And, and tell me this, because it's very unusual. I mean, the tradition for a director, in, you know, in my experience, is that you watch the first few shows and then you come occasionally just to check that it's all doing OK. And I presume that a lot of your experience in theatre has been like that. Yes, or abandoned. Or abandoned. And so you've got completely the opposite with Mike. Yes. I think, again, some people felt the pressure more than I did. I, I, I did feel it, but not as badly as some of the actors. Some of them would say things like, oh, I just need him to not be there tonight so I can do the performance for the audience, not for him. Ah. And I didn't feel that pressure so greatly, admittedly, but uh, it, if you've just had some hefty note sessions and you're trying to change a gear on a performance or add something new in, the danger always with with me, I can't speak for everybody, the mere is that those notes feel like big mountains. Mm. Mm. And you come to them and you want to fulfil the note at the expense of maybe everything else, you know, so... Yes. It's not a smooth, clean journey, uh, the performance anymore. Do you think, um, and uh, this, is a, this is a question I never expected to ask you. Do you think that Mike understood actors or understands them? I, sh I shouldn't put it in the past tense. Oh, that's a big question. I think more than most directors, but to say understood means you really can see the workings. My caveat on that is I don't think anybody can see the workings, include, including me. Yeah, yeah. That's what I'm talking about, is that you are engaging the unknown, Yeah. yeah. the subconscious. I think he knows that. He knows he's trying to engage that subconscious but but we're all meddling with something that we don't fully understand. Mm. Yeah. And that's exciting. Yeah. But he's asking you to 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 try at least to tap into that. He's that... giving us all the tools to do it if we if we 
are prepared to. He gave us all the tools to just open ourselves to the moment, completely to the moment. Gosh, okay. So much so that on, on stage, things happened that I did that I wasn't expecting to do. Now that sounds like it's out of control. I don't think it was. I think it was something else surfacing. Can you, I mean, do you, when you look back on your experience of working with shared experience, do you have individual moments or is it, a, a, do you have a sort of general sense of, of how, you know, how exciting or, or Both. it was? Both. Both. You have your specific moments where... Oh, yes. Yes, absolutely. Give us one. Tell us one, if you can think of one. Do you know the seagull? Yeah. I played a, a cardinal, as we pronounce it. People pronounce it different ways, a, a cardinal. And she was a, um, a pretty narcissistic, that's a judgment, but I'll say that for speed, uh, actress, and was having a terrible row with her son the way it was going that evening was a very high row. Sometimes it was a cold row. Other times it would be a, a fiery row. That night was a fiery row. And he had been grabbing me to try and get through to me. And in the middle of this row, whilst not letting the temperature drop, I walked past a mirror and fixed my hair and the audience laughed. I was not expecting them to laugh. But it just, it happened. It happened because the character must at all times be at her absolute best, even while she's having a row. And um, the other actor didn't enjoy it. And I understand why, because he didn't know why they were, the audience were laughing, because he couldn't see what I was doing. Mm. That kind of thing, you see, that, I would never have planned that. No. And that's such a complex moment. Because, oh. because you know you are playing what you see as your as 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 you the, the yes. person yes but of course he might object that you were you know that classic phrase upstaging him yeah i was upstaging him i can't I have to admit to that i have to admit to that if i'm to criticize him it's that he should have been aware of it and he was maybe yes yes yeah interesting you, you, got, you know you really need your peripheral vision on stage you know if someone's going to do something you've got to yeah and well everything is attuned to the other person you asked about the other person not a while back i think the other person is the most important thing on stage it's it's your it's the material you work with is the other actor That's what you're trying to change. That's what you're trying to get through to. Yeah. But that, I think, is one of the great... Uh, you said you use the word courage, mm. you know, and part of that courage is to not feel that you have got to come up with all the answers in terms of your performance, but no. you're available for the, being changed by the other person as well. Well, it takes the pressure off, if you think about it. It takes the pressure off me and it puts it into the middle of the space between us. Yeah. And that's that's what, what an audience wants to see. That's what, it's the push and pull between two people that's the most exciting thing. Yeah. If we're working, you are my um, medium. Yeah. yeah. If we were actors, you would be my medium. I would work on you. And tell me this, do have, um, you know, in your career since shared experience, have you yeah. been picked up on this? Have, has somebody said, uh, Pam, I don't feel that you're actually talking to that other person. I don't feel, or is it something that you have not learned, but you know, you've imbibed somehow and that now it becomes something that you want to do is to sort of make yourself available. Well, there are lots of questions in there because you suggest that a director might have the perspicacity and daring to mention it which most of them don't they very few directors have the rigor that mike has mm. mainly there isn't the time and maybe uh, and 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 
that's certainly not the time in television. You just go in and say your lines in television these days. There is no time for anything else. We used to discuss whether a scene worked or not. We don't do that anymore. We just go in and say the lines. Um, and that hurts. I hate that. That's why I can't really do it much anymore. Um, but as far as theatre goes that I've done since Mike, generally it's too polite to question the ability or the technique of the actor. Hmm. And Mike isn't polite. Do you think? Do you think if if he if you came into his company now because it, it's just, maybe people would be overawed by you nowadays? I mean, if you're I've member, heard that and I find that extraordinary. But you know, yes, okay, I have heard that. And they'd be fr frightened. They'd be scared to say something to you because you know you're so experienced and. I I don't know how I can give the signals out that I'm prepared to talk about anything. I I do that as quickly and as best I can. I haven't done a theatre production for a long time, but but generally it's uh, it's not picked up on. Mm. You know, no holds barred as far as I'm concerned. Mm. OK, I'm going to I'm going to push now. You've 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 done this amazing um, uh, Dickens Bleak House. Now you go into the one that I saw science fictions. Is that right? <laughs> Yes, yes, I think so. Yes, that was next. And, yes. uh, and uh, you know, in, in my mythology, I don't think, I think Mike corrected me on this, in my mythology of this, because I, I met Mike and I met you, you and Rad and people up in Sheffield. I was doing a show up there. So oddly enough, the same thing happened to me as happened mm -hmm. to you. Is that I got mm -hmm. to meet Mike, I got to meet you, and I was kind of, you know, a groupie. Um, but um, what I was, I never used the word. But that's what I was when I first saw it, yeah. Um, you know, it was just overwhelming to see this. And the Cymbeline was just the most uh, kind of pellucid, clear, wonderful, magical evening. And exactly like you, it, you know, you come in and there's nothing there and there's just f five or six actors in white clothes and mm. not sets or anything. Anyway, um, but it wasn't six months rehearsal, but it was a pretty huge time for science fictions you had. Yes, it was. I can't remember how long. It was 13 weeks, 12 weeks, something like that. Unbelievable. I mean, that, that just wouldn't... And Mike would fight for that. He would fight for the money to do it. And if we couldn't get the money, we would do it for free because we knew that it needed that long. Our, I know, remember ex distinctly how my character developed uh, as Serefa Lamap. And... Um, that's oh the the le was important to me because it gave it a certain flair. It's Pamela, so it's a ref a le map, and um, we were looking for characters and we're using God all sorts of things. So one day Mike said, "Okay, get three or four things out of your bag and put them down and explain to them why they're important to you uh, for your life in space," hmm. and. I had a lipstick, a hairbrush, and a Tampax. And uh, <laughs> I thought, this that's what gave me Serefa. That's what gave me Serefa. Because the lipstick is to, you mustn't let your standards drop, even though you've been in space 500 years. Um, the hairbrush, likewise, but it also because it has some technical ability with the lingua lecta that allows you to change um, your language that you're speaking that was invented that same day and then the tampax which caused her immense embarrassment of having to explain this to everybody and so it struck me that hilariously if someone was easily embarrassed and had to contact an alien species you have the double pull which is very clown uh, very clown like that you, you really want to speak to people, but if they're a bit slimy, you don't want to go in there. And so, so there's a kind of double push-pull thing going on. And, and that's how Serefa was born. The embarrassment of, of bodily functions um, and a desire to be warm and intellectual at the same time. Oh, wow. Now, Mike said that you would do interviews. Yes. No, but I thought it was a flower. No, did it turn into a flower? It was a flower. My lingua lecta was a flower, which in my imagination was wired into my brain. Yes. 
and that so, by touching a certain petal you would change the the language that you spoke but sometimes if she had been caught in an airlock <laughs> it would change and she wouldn't realize it so she would be speaking klingon or something for quite a while before she realized oh dear oh dear did you i mean you know when i've talked to rad about science fictions i remember the very first time i ever talked to him about it you know i said i had this the floor and he said well you were in you came to a very lucky night because sometimes we could oh really yes stop. oh yes there was hit and miss nights i remember the high times though i remember the times the speaker system acts on tour accidentally clicked into the local taxi firm <laughs> and we were on stage and they were calling for somewhere up north calling for a car to 43 albert street and we're going oh my god <laughs> we've contacted an alien life form and uh, it was just hilarious and it and the cat at the ica you did did you were you I, I there heard about the it. Cat? tell me about it the cat came on stage from under the bleachers they'd been looking for it all day and it came out right in the middle of my solo piece describing how to contact an alien life form and the cat just sat like a star and watched me for about five minutes and then just got up and walked off it couldn't have been better and the beauty of it being improvised was i was able to use that and people were saying afterwards how did you train the cat no we didn't train the cat we just used it Oh, look, uh, look, talking of training cats, uh, we've missed something that I know yes. Mike talked about in Arabian Nights, I think it was, wasn't it? Go on. This was to do with something to do with your hair. Right. Now, my memory of this is, is a little foggy, but I tell you where I think it happened was on tour. Um, and the, the lines are from the Princess Boudour, which I, we had been playing there a year before with the Arabian Nights, whatever this venue was. And her lines are, know that her hair was as dark as the separation of friends. It fell in rivers to her feet like a night without moon. And you go, oh, that is long, dark hair. Um, a year later, in a very crowded foyer, I was told, come here, come here, this man remembers last year and is asking where the actress is with the long dark hair. And there was I with shoulder length red hair. Oh, funny. Isn't that wonderful? And I, he said, this is the actress with the long dark hair. And he goes, oh no, but you haven't. And I said, but, and he said, but you did have long dark. No, I said, I didn't have long dark hair last year. Fantastic. So that's the power of something that you're opening up for people as well. And that links that links with the childlikeness of what you did in those schools when they were drawing those dragons and everything. Absolutely. And I, one thing more, no wig could have done that job. No. no. Do you see what I mean? No wig could give that person the experience of the most beautiful, silky, midnight dark hair to the floor. Yes. And that's um, what we gave him. But it's also a tribute to him that he was so involved. To us all, to us all, if we allow it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That he's completely present with that idea and those and that language, which is actually not that simple. It's beautiful. It's the, it's the um, what's his name? Um, Richard Burton, isn't it? Yes, Sir Richard Burton, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's very rich. Yeah. You can't rush it because it's like a, you know, oof very very rich meal nice mm. okay so you've you, you've got shared experience you, I'm, I'm sorry science fictions you're having a good time and you're still with the company yes and then you then you do your first shakespeare and this is a big this is i mean uh, as we discussed the other day i was talking to mike and he said because he's reading hamlet at the moment and he said well actually i did hamlet um mm. a couple of times i did one at cincinnati and I did, uh, did it at Lambda. But, um, you know, he'd always had issues with Shakespeare. He'd always found them very tricky. And then he came across Cymbeline. He liked it. He thought, I can deal, I can deal with this. How was that as a rehearsal process? And, you know, um, had you done, by the way, had you done some Shakespeare? Yes, I've done a fair bit before. Um, 
like any jobbing actor, I'd done Shakespeare's at various reps. Um, I loved Shakespeare and I still love Shakespeare. Uh, Roger, my husband, is an actor and I we, we marvel constantly at the, uh, the brilliance of the richness of it. Um, we had, we, we joke about this, I think we had 14 weeks rehearsal and I think it was two weeks too long. That's a joke, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, we were ready to go, but we had another two weeks left. Mike started that with gongs. Has he mentioned the gongs? I think he might have done. I can't remember. Tell me. He had two fantastic big Japanese gongs and he loved the vibrations of them and he thought we would use these as part of the the performance. It, after a couple of weeks we realised the gongs were more interesting than we were so the gongs went. <laughs> but there was so much fabulous work in that we played music, we became musicians and played music mimed instruments and played like a string quartet or quartet with other instruments harmonizing pieces of music we became little bands mm -hmm. so i my part on um one particular song was <laughs> You see, and then everybody else is going whoop, doop, 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 and we played this music. Wonderful. With a fabulous musical director as well. So, you who, know, who was your musical director? Yeah, I wish I could remember. I think it was Ilona. Ilona, Ilona yeah. Cash. yeah. Yeah. She, she would write a piece of music for violin, flute, da, 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 and we would mime the instruments and make the noises. Were you, were you, were Not you my the, idea. Clever. No. Uh, ju ju um, this is sort of slightly tangential, but were you the same company as had done um, science fictions? Uh, no, not quite. Well, there was uh, John Dix came back for Cymbeline. Um, ah, there was a subtle shift. Rod was still there. I was still there. Um, I think we lost Tony. Uh, no, it was a subtle shift. Okay. But still people that you felt, because I mean, part of the, the sort of something you said earlier was that you, 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 you love being with these people, you trusted them, you, you celebrated what, you know, what they were able to do. Mm. Did you still have that sense of, you know, trust and, and freedom with the other people? Yes, yes. But we are still dealing with something that we don't fully understand, uh, which is ourselves and each other. So you only see the the the, the surface of it. But there was a sense of a, a will of wanting to make this really free and and not in any way repeating anybody else's concept of Shakespeare or repeating ourselves every night. So that we just kept it as fresh as it could be. Mm. I don't, th I think I'd like to go back. If I had the physical ability, I would love to have another go at that because I don't think I ever realized the full woof of it, the width and the richness. Well, of, of, the, of the play? Of or... the play. Okay, yes, I think we, I think you always feel that, don't you? I mean, I remember even as a 13 year old boy, I played Olivia in Twelfth Night and I remember the the um, the the holiday after playing that from school, I just kept on going, oh, no, no, I didn't understand that. Oh, I know. no. Or or when you finished and you you hear an echo in your line, you go, oh, that's what it means. Oh, that's yeah, what it means. Exactly. Exactly. And somehow he 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 puts little um, puns, little harmonics in the word Shakespeare. He's always doing it and you you d sometimes don't notice them until much later. You go, oh, that's why he said not, because it's not and it's also a not, you know, so. Yeah. Uh, yeah, wonderful stuff. Yeah. And um, and that toured and that did well. And then and, was, that, yeah, was that the end of that, your yeah. time with, with shared experience i think it was mike and i worked together again because we did for um oxford 
no, Cambridge. Um, Method of Madness, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we did um, The Seagull. The Seagull. We did La Ronde together. Of course you did, I saw that, yes. And uh, yeah, that was that was hard work. Ilona did the music on that, which was wonderful. And we had the costumes made very authentically by the um, um, London School of Art. They were amazing. Their costumes were fantastic, and were performed as you know. But the the dressing and undressing was performed. Yes. Wow. I saw that. I think in Sheffield. You did it in Sheffield. Yes, we did it in Sheffield. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah. And uh, yes, because the two of you and uh, Mike says that, you know, you spent a lot, quite a lot of rehearsal making sure that, you you know, that, that this became the a performance as well, getting in and out of. Your yes, head. a lot of work on that with time to the music and so on. Yes. The, the kind of we decided that she would, you know, would finally be naked in the last scene. And there were photographs of that. But sadly, they when I became Ma Larkin in the, the in Darling Buds of May, they went and found a photograph of me wow. and put it in the paper and the headline was, Ooh Pa, look what Ma's up to now. And you go, what kind of distorted view of theatre and television is that? How, how can anybody justify that? Because it's a lie. It's a lie. It had happened years before, anyway. Ah, oh, I mean, you know, you know, horrible. I don't get it. I don't and, get and it. Then, and then you kind of think, oh, goodness me. I mean, is, is there anything else out there? And, you know, and, and yeah, yeah. You know, censor yeah. my life. And... Yeah. And you are trying to achieve something that is quite difficult and takes a lot of work and, and delicate. It, it just felt really trampled over at that point. So, um, but I'm sure most people have a story like that. <laughs> yeah. Well, yes. I mean, I suppose if if if, if you've appeared naked, then then the, you're fair game. Yeah, you're fair game. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So we've sort of we've sort of covered most of your experience with Mike. Is that right? Would you say that? Oh, no I mean, I way. This... No way. I don't know where to be. I owe him so much. I can't. I, it's unfathomable what he's given me. Unfathomable. <sighs> the, the richness of vision that he supplies, the unending commitment that he supplies is just, I can't praise him too highly. I really can't. And at the same time as feeling criticised and hurt by him, you know it's for a greater good. Mm. Mm. And, uh, yeah, it was tough. There were times he was hard on us, really hard on us. But um, I, I, think I, I, think I, I think I was very much into authority. I think I, I, my, my feeling towards him was one of he knows best. And I, I always gave him the benefit of the doubt, even when it did hurt. Mm. But it did me so much good. I, oh, I can't tell you. I can't tell you, Peter. It's just... I'm starting to rave and rant a bit now. I'm so sorry. Because there really aren't words for it. Yeah. There really aren't. Well, this is, I think, this is the, um, this is the kind of frustration that I certainly feel. I mean, I, I witnessed a, re a rehearsal process as an assistant to him. So I did see a lot of the way in which he worked, but, uh, you know, I, I only saw the end results of what I saw of, you know, the work that you were involved in. Mm -hmm. And and so that the kind of um, moment to moment richness that you can feel in a rehearsal process as well as in a performance. Mm -hmm. You know, those those moments in, you know, that Mike also identifies sometimes. He says, you know, suddenly something would happen in a rehearsal. You yes. Know, where somebody pushed something to a place that nobody had ever imagined. Right, right, right. And the contrast between that and a certain deadening quality where you could be in a rehearsal room and you could feel sort of just 
the energy the energy drain through the floor yes yeah yes I think that there is, I mean, I'm, I'm speaking as an old woman now, and I think I look back at a lot of my time, there's a sense of pioneering about discovery, about widening. Now, I, I maybe it's there in a different medium or in a different way, but I don't see it anymore. And what I see is a de-skilling and a narrowing. And I think that you know, when we could make concrete, we put up a lot of concrete buildings. Now we've got CGI and incredibly delicate editing. That's what we do. Mm. You can edit in film an, a, a, an amazing performance out of a really bad performance. Mm. And so as actors were being de-skilled. In the theatre, I don't know, there must be some good stuff happening. I haven't seen any really good stuff for a long time, though. And again, maybe that's my age. Maybe I just have rose tinted spectacles. I don't know. But, you know, I, I've worked in drama schools quite a lot. And, and one of the things that um, that I've noticed is that, uh, you know, I'm working with actors. We, we, you know, they are expected to read plays and the plays are not what they really want to do. You know what they want to do for right. the is television Films. and film. Yeah, yeah. You know, theatre is is becoming more and more. Again, uh, I you know, as an older person, maybe I, I hope to be refuted about this, but yeah. it becomes more and more sort of a niche um, art, and we probably aren't training our actors to work in theatre with that kind of level of physical and vocal commitment. Right. That, Right. That, that we remember. And also, yeah, yes, I'm sorry, I'm interrupting you, Peter, but uh, the very first time I saw someone wearing a mic in the Olivier Theatre, I thought it was the end. That is a big theatre. What you don't do is give a small performance and amplify it technically. You give a big performance in a big space. And I think we have, because of film and television, we have lost respect for that magnificent thing which is a big performance and a big performance and this i learned from mike is not um just being grossly inflated it's the magnification of detail so you have as much detail in a big performance as you do in a tiny television performance but you you make it bigger and then it can be an amazing form of art but I fear it may be now past because people aren't committing physically yeah. anymore. It seems to be from here up. Yeah. And and it's it's interesting. I remember I worked at Glyndebourne before I went to university, and I remember those singers. You would be uh, sort of eight yards away from them. <gasps> felt their vi the vibrations of their voices were kind of hitting you, um, and. It's the same with the kind of performances you're talking about, you know, yes. the ability to, to go beyond the proscenium march, as it were, to, to, to right. kind of exude that energy that, that connects with us as an audience. And that can only happen in live theatre. It can't happen anywhere else. Because yeah. you need to be physically there and you need to be travelling through time at the same time. Oh, Ralph Richardson's, what is acting? Acting is carving time. I mean, that's a hell of a quote, isn't it? carving time yeah and so, but if you're not all present at the same time you know if i recorded that in 1968 and you watch it in 1970 there's no way you're working together as an audience and a performer yeah it's it's great stuff don't get me wrong and it's made me a very good living film and television but it's not the same animal so why have you not worked in the theater for a while it's hard work, I think. I th oh, you see, I Mike asked me this and I cried because I have such love and respect for this thing called a stage and an audience that I couldn't possibly do it if I wasn't working at my peak. I can't make choices because I don't have the physical ability. I'm not crippled for goodness sake, but I just don't have the energy or the physical suppleness or the uh, freedom physically to do the things that I would want to, to be able to do on stage. Mm -hmm. 
and that it deserves. Mm. Okay. It's okay. I'm not crying. I don't mind crying. You see, that's the thing that my it's not something to apologize for. I think it's great. Yeah. Yeah. It tells me it means something to me. We had a long, Mike and I had a long conversation about the difference between really feeling something and an actor feeling something. What is the subtle difference between the two? I think it is, it, the feeling is exactly the same. But I think that when it happens to me, Pam, I don't have a choice. Mm. But when I, I, allow it is being the word to happen to a character i have the choice to go into that mm. but the feeling is the same it was one of the things that that i kind of knew instinctively when i was a young young actor i'm not an actor now but you know when, no, no. when I was a young actor and then i i think i i started to think you peter you can't feel these things because you're acting and and I, it, it would it would i would sort of think why am I feeling all this? And of course, it wasn't me. It was it was me, but it wasn't me. Just right, like right. saying, you know, because I'm adopting, I'm playing a let's say I'm playing an uptight lawyer or something or right. whatever. You know, that's not who I am. But but uh, you know, and I feel some aggression towards somebody in the scene. I'm feeling. I'm actually feeling that. Right. I'm feeling right. it, aren't I? Right. You know. Yes. Yes. It's happening. But you're allowing it to take you over. It doesn't take you over, which is what happens to me and happened to me just then. I, I felt moved. But you can allow that to happen if you have access to that big well of whatever it is we are inside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <sighs> oh, Pam, it's been a real pleasure. Thank uh, you. I'm, I feel I have. Uh, let me let me sum up what I think I've done. I think I've probably confused people. <laughs> I, I think rather than clarifying something, I feel at this point that I've over explained some stuff and I hope I've done Mike justice because I really do think he's a genius and I, I owe him a lot. Thank you for watching um, and I hope you enjoyed that, uh, that chat and if you did, would you press the like button and also um, the uh, the subscribe button that would be great and if you wanted to be given alerts to when the next one is happening just press the bell button um, if you want to put any comments or any questions underneath here underneath the video please do and at some point I will um, re-interview Mike as it were and put some of these questions to him so um, I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you.